This program is brought to you by Emory University. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you all to Dr. Andrew Freeman. He is the Associate Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. He completed his internal medicine uh, residency at Brown University and cardiology fellowship at Temple University Hospital. Upon completion of his fellowship, he joined National Jewish Health, where he currently serves as the Director of Clinical Cardiology, as well as the Director of Cardiovascular Prevention and Wellness. He also started and oversees the Ornish Intensive Cardiac Rehab Program. He holds a monthly walk with a doc program in Denver where he walks with patients on Saturday mornings and also teaches them key health concepts. He has held a number of leadership positions in his state chapter of the ACC, and he is the founding chair of the ACC Lifestyle and Nutrition Work Group and sat on the steering committee for the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Council. He has lectured and published extensively on plant-based nutrition. And this morning, he will, speak, he will be speaking to us on the Year in Plants 2021. Dr. Freeman, go ahead. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be around uh, uh, friends and uh, colleagues that I've known for a while. Um, so for those of you that have not seen me speak before, um, every year uh, you might be very impressed to learn just how little we as cardiologists uh, get in the nutrition space. So my hope is to give you, at least in the last year or so, uh, some of the highlights that I think are really important. Uh, and I, I think it's important that we arms, arm ourselves with prevention and nutrition in particular because it's so very low cost and so highly effective at improving cardiovascular outcomes. I also wanna point out there are lots of really well done randomized trials showing efficacy here, but there are also lots of observational or um, uh, sort of prospective studies that show not necessarily cause, but relationship. I also wanna point out that it's very hard often being the uh, sole sort of preventionist or plant-based person uh, or nutrition knowledgeable person in your institution, but don't be afraid to step up. And before I go too much further, everyone asks me, well, doc, if I eat this way, how am I gonna get my protein? And the truth is, where does the cow, the chicken, the pig, the duck get their protein? They're spending all day long eating grass and corn and greens. Uh, remember that Earth's biggest uh, uh, mammals, right? So elephants and um, gorillas and others uh, are spending all day long eating leaves and they're plenty strong. And remember that pound for pound, spinach, kale, broccoli actually have more protein than say a steak or chicken uh, or even eggs for that matter. But remember that, you know, a pound of steak might be a little tiny handful and a big pile of uh, uh, kale might be uh, what you might need to get your protein. You know, back in the day, uh, even when I was in training, some of the doctors who trained me were in the back when uh, this was stylish, so to speak, they were smokers. And the truth is lots of people these days uh, have learned uh, how, just how bad smoking is. And I think we will hopefully get over the concept where people are telling people to eat red meat all the time when we know now uh, that there are significant risks in doing so. And for those of you that have not seen some of the data from CDC and others, uh, the obesity rate, and these always lag several years behind, so this is the most recent data, was roughly 42.4% back in 2018. We're approaching roughly 50% uh, today. And the prevalence of obesity, uh, both obesity and severe obesity was the highest in non-Hispanic Black adults at about 50% and 13.8% again back in 2017 or 18. Uh, roughly 60% of non-Hispanic Black women were obese and adults between 40 and 59 years of age had the highest rates of both obesity and severe obesity. Uh, and this is more than 10% higher than the prevalence was back in 1999 to 2000. So we're in some serious trouble. And of course, many of us will have lots and lots of patients for years to come. It also matters, and we're finding this out, that what you eat before you're even born might matter. It certainly matters what you eat when you're born. Um, and it turns out that as the, the federal government weighs the dietary guidelines for children under two, these food habits man, uh, matter quite a bit. In fact, there's a critical window from between six to 12 months of age when children may be most receptive to new foods, including some of the bitter ones, the bitter greens that we all like to uh, tell people to eat. And scientists have also discovered that these influences occur even in their mother's diet via amniotic fluid and then later breast milk. So some studies have found that babies seem to enjoy these foods more than others when they start eating solids. Uh, believe it or not, up to 99% of children uh, eat less than the recommended amount of vegetables. 
half of children four to eight are eating less than the recommended amount of fruit, and 6% of babies six to 12 months are eating any dark green vegetables on any given day. We also know that hypertension is on the rise, right? Roughly 50% of Americans have some form of heart disease, most of which is hypertension. And where you guys are, uh, the rural South, uh, perhaps not you guys are being more urban, uh, but the most concerning uh, trends where the stroke belt is. Uh, we also know that as we follow uh, folks, and these are about 4,700 men and women from uh, uh, ages 40 to 59 in Japan, China, and the United Kingdom, United States, uh, following a healthy plant-based diet index actually dropped blood pressure about a millimeter mercury but if you eat the same sort of plant-based diet that's unhealthy, and remember a plant-based diet that's unhealthy can be things like Coca-Cola and potato chips and, uh, and uh, Oreo cookies, which are plant-based. So if you eat these highly processed foods, it actually can worsen your health. Uh, in this particular case, it actually increases blood pressure. We also know uh, that of particular risk are African-Americans and black populations in the United States. This was an interesting pilot study of five week uh, plant-based nutrition intervention 44 African-American volunteers that committed to eating home delivery of non-dairy vegetarian meals. Uh, and they actually had a significant drop in their ASCVD risk and LDL and blood pressure. And they actually adhered to the diet around 93% of the time. If you want a lower body mass index, it turns out, and this has been shown many, many times, that uh, going vegetarian uh, significantly improves body mass index. And it turns out in this study of about 9,000 folks in Germany eating fewer animal products lowers the BMI when compared to those who consume more fish, eggs, dairy, and meat. This was an interesting study also this last year. Uh, 20 participants uh, were followed a uh, low-fat vegan diet or a low-carb diet for two weeks, then they switched, and 700 fewer daily calories were consumed on the low-fat plant-based diet when compared to the low-carb diet. No differences in satiety, even on the plant-based diet. Both groups lost weight, but the low-fat diet resulted in significant reductions in body fat. Uh, this was a really interesting study out of Tehran, uh, Tehran lipid and glucose study, about 5,000 participants, and those who consume the most red and processed meat increased their risk for chronic kidney disease by 73% and up to 99% respectively. Swapping one serving of red or processed meat with a serving of legumes or grains lowered the risk for disease by up to 30%. And remember that CKD is an incredibly uh, growing disease state in the United States. In fact, there's been quite a few studies published in the last couple of years in this space. Uh, this was a review, and basically they said that issues may not have been as significant as previously thought, and the advantages to switching to a plant-based diet for renal patients is important, and the benefit ratio of plant-based diet appears to be tilting in their favor. Uh, this was another study, um, and it's interesting that they basically said that plant-based diets have a low endogenous acid load, which actually can mitigate some of the metabolic acidosis in patients with CKD. Many people are concerned about plant phosphorus, but it's actually bound to phytate and less bioavailable than animal phosphorus. And restriction of plant foods as a strategy to prevent hyperkalemia deprives patients with CKD of their benefits. So a very interesting review. How about this study? So we've all heard about olive oil and potentially its benefits, particularly in the Mediterranean study, which is a plant-based diet. Uh, in the Predimed study in particular. So replacing five grams of margarine, butter, or mayonnaise with olive oil actually lowers the risk of CAD by 7%. 62,000 women from the nurse's health study, 32,000 men from the health professional's follow-up study, and no significant associations were observed when olive oil was compared to other plant oils. This is another interesting study of about 37,000 Americans. Um, those who ate the most plant protein were 27% less likely to die versus 29% less likely to die from heart disease compared with people who ate the least, replacing just 5% of the calories from animal protein with an equal number of calories from plant protein results in a 50% decrease in risk from dying from any cause, including heart disease. So think about these numbers. When was the last time you saw any study, any publication that showed a magnitude of study this large? Replacing just 2% of processed red meat with plant protein resulted in a third less death. I mean, these are very powerful. You cannot get these with pills. How about strokes in middle-aged women? So this was an interesting study of about 60,000 women. They estimated 26-year risk under no lifestyle interventions, about 4.7% for total stroke, 2.4 for ischemic stroke. With exercise, not smoking, weight loss, this 26-year risk dropped and ischemic stroke risk dropped significantly. In fact, lifestyle modifications were estimated to reduce the 26-year risk of total stroke by a quarter and ischemic stroke by over a third. 
and sustained dietary modifications were estimated to reduce the 26 year risk of stroke by about a quarter. Pretty powerful. This was an interesting one in the British Medical Journal. Uh, the key messages here were obesity and alcohol increase the risk of several types of cancer. And these are important nutritional factors. For colorectal cancer, processed meat increases the risk and red meat probably increases the risk. I'll point out if you haven't seen uh, but in the United States, we now have the record of the number of people under 40 with colon cancer in the world. So we have the highest rates in young people that have ever been seen before. And foods, foods containing mutagens can cause cancer. Most of these are uh, meats and processed fish. In fact, salted fish can cause nasopharyngeal cancer and foods contaminated with aflatoxin, which is quite prevalent, cause liver cancer. Fruits and vegetables not linked to cancer low intakes might increase the risk for aerodigestive cancers, believe it or not. So very powerful and interesting results. So how about diabetes? So for those of you that are not familiar, the American Diabetes Association a couple of years ago has finally endorsed a low-fat plant-based diet as a way to reverse or hold diabetes from progressing. This was a 28 article uh, meta-analysis and those who consume the most total meat, red bean and processed meat increase their diabetes markedly by up to a third. An extra 100 grams per day for total meat or red meat increased the risk by 36%, and 50 grams per day increased the risk for diabetes by about 50%. And then in another study of 10,000 participants with diabetes, this is the EPIC cohort, those who ate the most fruit or vegetables reduced the risk for diabetes by up to 50%. 66 grams per day of more fruit and veggies were associated with a 25% lower risk of diabetes. And then many of you have heard me speak before about eggs, it turns out that sadly eggs are sort of a dose response relationship. So the more eggs you eat, the more diabetes you're likely to have. This was an interesting study showing that when you look at blood glucose levels of 8,500 participants, one or more eggs per day increases the risk of diabetes by a third. And again, the same result has been shown over and over and over again. How about cooked meat? So this was a very interesting one also. Um, researchers compared a diet in uh, high in red and processed meat with 51 participants and they track their levels of their advanced glycogen end products. This is what you get when you really roast or, or make your meats well done. And those who ate the red and processed meat increased their concentra uh, concentrations of several of these compounds um, when compared to those who followed a diet with no meat. And it turns out that carbs are really not the enemies of uh, enemy of diabetes. For those of you that have not uh, heard this before, it is true that carb restriction can control diabetes. But if you're trying to get rid of diabetes and you've not had it forever and ever, right? Once you have diabetes for 20, 30 years, sometimes it's hard to really undo. But if you can get the fat uh, stores out of the muscle and the liver, the glut receptors start to work again. And it turns out when you eat a lower fat diet higher in complex carbs, you actually can significantly reduce diabetes. So in this particular study of 4.7 person year, 4.7 million person years of follow-up, those who ate the most whole grains, including breakfast cereals, oatmeal, dark bread, brown rice had a 29% reduction in diabetes compared to those who ate the lowest amount of grains. Now, I have bad news for those of you that are soda fans. It turns out uh, that uh, both uh, uh, regular and artificially sweetened have more risk of bad outcomes. So higher intakes of sugary drinks and uh, artificially sweetened beverages were associated with a higher risk of CBD. And if you look carefully at this chart here, you can see that no matter which way you go, red or blue, sugary or artificially sweetened, you end up with bad outcomes. So sadly, really the perfect beverage for human consumption is really water, with a close second being unsweetened tea and unsweetened coffee. I will tell you that the much maligned potato turns out to be surprisingly not that unhealthful. In fact, it's very healthful, provided you don't ruin it with butter, cheese, and sour cream, and of course, bacon. Uh, but 24 participants here with diabetes ate one of four experimental dinners and included potatoes prepared multiple ways versus a dinner with rice. Blood sugar was followed. It turns out no difference in glucose response between the meals. And the overnight glucose response was actually controlled after a potato dinner. How about gestational diabetes? Uh, this was an interesting study of women, 117,000. Uh, dietary intake was scored according to the Healthful Plant-Based Diet Index. And it turns out uh, that the, uh, there was a strong inverse association. So those who ate a plant-based diet had less gestational diabetes, and they also identified a 13% lower risk of gestational diabetes for every 10-point increment improvement on the plant-based diet index. And for those of you not aware, gestational diabetes is on the rise, and this then sets women up later in life for both diabetes and heart disease. Our friend cinnamon. So I would tell you again, cinnamon and spices are surprisingly good. 
For those of you unaware, cinnamon is a plant. It comes from tree bark. Uh, and uh, 52 people, 27 in the cinnamon group here. Those who took the cinnamon supplement had more stable blood sugar levels, modest drops in A1C. So feel free to add cinnamon to things, just not the sugar. And who doesn't like to die less? So in this interesting study from the AARP, about 237,000 men, 180,000 women roughly, 3% of animal protein uh, was replaced by plant-based protein. Uh, and they actually had reduced risk of death by 12%, overall death risk dropped by 10%. And these associations were strongest when it came to replacing protein from eggs and red meat with plant protein up to a quarter less dying. And another study in the same vein uh, showed that a higher intake of total protein actually had a lower risk of all-cause mortality. Remember, in lots of parts of the world, there are protein deficiencies because there are calorie deficiencies and nutrient deficiencies. But it turns out that if that protein comes from plants, you had a significantly a lower risk of all-cause mortality and a marked risk of less cardiovascular disease mortality. Remember that I've always uh, spoken about inflammation being the root cause for all disease. And it turns out that diets with the most pro-inflammatory foods such as red and processed meat markedly increase the risk for cardiovascular coronary disease and stroke. And when compared to diets with more anti-inflammatory foods, green leafy vegetables, yellow vegetables, and whole grains are, which of course, the best. It's interesting, uh, we've seen a lot of publications in the last couple of months to years about COVID and diet, right? One of the greatest risk factors for COVID uh, contraction is obesity. And it turns out that not, obesity is not only linked to diabetes and heart disease, but also uh, COVID, as I mentioned. And uh, it says here, uh, this is again from the British Medical Journal, our food systems are making us ill. The COVID-19 outbreaks and meat packing plants have focused minds in the meat industry. Uh, last month, Dr. Tan and colleagues wrote that the food industry should be held partly accountable, not only for the obesity pandemic, but for the severity of COVID-19 disease. Uh, so very powerful outcomes. And for those of you that don't follow the British Medical Journal, they've had an enormous selection of articles on the environment, the earth, uh, and nutrition over the last couple of years that are truly eye-opening. So I work at National Jewish, which is a big respiratory hospital. People are always surprised to learn that asthma and diet have a huge interaction. Interestingly, remember asthma is an inflammatory disease. So if you control the inflammation, people get better. So this is a new review on asthma. Uh, asthma cases have uh, risen markedly over the last several years. Diets that emphasize fruits, vegetables, and uh, whole grains min and minimize saturated fat reduce the risk. Uh, dairy consumption markedly increases the risk. And I would argue that dairy can be one of the more inflammatory substances we consume virtually on a regular basis, almost every meal in most American households. So the good news about coffee is it continues to show positive outcomes. Uh, in this particular study here of 13,000 uh, incident arrhythmic events, turns, that, uh, uh, turns out that compared with not drinking coffee, five plus cups a day lowers the risk for arrhythmias. Uh, and I would point out that it's really habitual coffee drinking that has better outcomes. So if you're one of those people who drinks no coffee and then once a month you have three or four or five cups, you're definitely gonna notice it. Uh, whereas if you slowly ramp up and maintain that, there seems to be better outcomes also along with high blood pressure. This is a really, really interesting study here of 5,000 uh, folks from Japan. A cup of green tea every day was associated with 15% lower mortality, two to three cups up to 27% reduction, four cups of 40% drop. And then if you have coffee, a cup a day, 12% lower, two plus cups, 41% reduction. And then if you manage to combine coffee and tea, so you have a 63% lower death rate for four plus cups of green tea and two plus cups of coffee per day. Now I wanna point out if you have this much time to drink all this coffee and tea, maybe you're not working, maybe you're not a doctor, I don't know, but nonetheless, it definitely improves outcomes. And then believe it or not, up to nine cups of coffee per day had a 9% lower risk of developing prostate cancer. And then maybe you should drink more of these flavanols and these come in a variety of different ways, including from berries as well. 26,000 participants, the difference in blood pressure with the lowest versus highest intake was up to about four millimeters of mercury. And this is a comparable uh, change to the DASH diet uh, study. Berries, teas, et cetera, should have a more prominent role in the maintenance of cardiovascular health. Uh, speaking of berries, this was a study uh, following people for about 20 years from the uh, Framingham Heart Study offspring cohort. Those who have the highest total flavonoid intake from berries, fruits, and other plants were 40% uh, percent less likely to develop dementia, which in many cases is another form of vascular disease, in this case, cerebrovascular disease. Speaking of the DASH trial, uh, this was a, a follow-up of the DASH trial 
where they follow folks uh, and then they put them on eight weeks of monitored feeding with a control diet uh, of what American uh, standard American diet, a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, but similar to the control diet or the DASH diet. And it turns out the fruit and vegetable heavy diets did significantly better. Um, and none of the markers differ between the fruit and vegetable and DASH diet. Remember, a DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stopping hypertension, is truly a plant-based diet. For those of you that enjoy sushi, I want you to consider switching to plant-based sushi or veggie sushi, which I would argue is equally good. But in these day, this day and age, our uh, seas are quite polluted. Fish used in sushi and other marine life contain 283 times more parasites than they did in 1960s. In fact, you may be seeing a rise in a very rare condition, anisocodosis. Uh, so in general, you might want to consider switching to veggie sushi. This was an interesting one about soy and tofu. A lot of people are very worried about it. I would tell you if you can find organic non-GMO soy and tofu, which is a soy-based product, these are better. Um, isoflavones from these products are inversely associated with coronary heart disease. In fact, if you look at the uh, lowest versus highest, 13% less coronary heart disease, and this study consumption of tofu but not soy milk was inversely associated with the risk. There's actually a metabolite produced in the gut, and I would, turn, I would uh, in, encourage you to start looking at some of the studies in the gut flora realm, but this uh, concept of uh, equal uh, it seems to be associated with the uh, reduced risk for dementia in that if you have more equal from dietary soy, uh, you have fewer white matter lesions than those with lower equal levels. So consider eating more soy if you don't already. This is an interesting study that I had uh, the pleasure of uh, working with my colleagues on uh, that just got published this last year about some of the disparities in diet uh, related cardiovascular disease. And it turns in this study called public health policy experts to address these disparities and reduce poor health outcomes in underserved populations, increasing access to healthful foods and disincentivizing low quality food purchases through revisions to some of the nutrition assistance programs. You may be aware, but SNAP and other uh, food support programs that are governmentally run, many times soda and sugar sweet beverages are the number one purchase. And it really should be things like fruits and vegetables, sadly. Uh, this was another great study here. And overall, it compared healthful and unhealthful plant-based dietary indices. And those with higher healthful plant-based dietary pattern were significantly protected against cardiovascular disease with a stronger case in women. And I would point out again that time and time again, it has been shown that following an unhealthful plant-based diet is actually worse than being omnivorous. So it's very important to eat a very uh, low-fat whole food plant-based diet. Or as I say to my patients, right now you're eating like a king or a queen. I really want you to spend time eating more like a peasant. There's a lot of wisdom in that. And we know back from the uh, Egyptian days that if you looked at the mummies, which were the royalty, they've done CAT scans on them, cardiac CTs on them. Most of them were very, very young and had coronary artery calcifications, uh, whereas we believe the peasants probably did not. Cruciferous veggies. Um, so this was an interesting one from Western Australia. It turns out that women in the study consume more than 45 grams a day, had 46% less aortic calcification, and the study strengthens the hypothesis that higher intake of such vegetables protects against vascular calcification. So this was a, a nice study that was done. It's called swap meat. And what they did is they instructed uh, participants to consume two servings per day of plant-based meat, some of these alternative meats, compared with animal meat. And it turns out there were significant drops in LDL weight and TMAO levels in the plant group. Now that said, these plant-based meats are not necessarily healthful foods. Realize that many of them contain just as much saturated fat as their animal counterparts. They just are not as bad for the environment and don't have the same cancer risks associated. So I usually tell people to use these sparingly, if at all. How about breast cancer and fiber? So this was a 19 study analysis and those who consume the most fiber had an 8% reduced risk for uh, uh, premenopausal and postmenopausal cancers. Soluble fiber from cereals, fruit, legumes, and vegetables showed the strongest association uh, with the strongest associations observed from fruit fiber. And I've shown before that breast cancer and fiber are, uh, breast cancer and plant-based diets are positively correlated, meaning less breast cancer with better diets. This was again, another study showing that dairy may be harmful. Um, it turns out that higher intakes of dairy were associated with a significant increase in uh, breast cancer risk up to 50%, full fat and reduced fat milk produce similar results. Uh, substituting median intakes of dairy milk with soy milk actually drops risk by about 32%. And then men are not immune either, prostate cancer. So this was about 2000 cases. Those who have the healthiest diets had 24% less prostate cancer risk. 
Those who had the healthiest diets had a 44% less high-grade prostate cancer risk. You may have seen the American Cancer Society released updated guidelines this last year. They've recommended increasing plant-based foods, excluding or limiting red and processed meat, and boosting physical activity, right? All things that seem to be no-brainers, but they're now actually in the guidelines. The European Society of Cardiology literally just released the very same recommendations. Uh, believe it or not, I get this all the time. A lot of the men that I take care of will tell me, well, doc, if I don't eat meat, I'm not going to be manly. Well, it turns out uh, that uh, men do not need to consume meat to maintain normal testosterone levels. In fact, the strongest man in the world right now uh, who holds all the records is a, uh, a full plant-based eater, believe it or not. This was another interesting study that plant-based diets can reduce the risk of non-communicable chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, heart disease by up to 50%. Uh, diets rich in this approach also reduce Alzheimer's, and in fact, plant-based diets are linked to longevity in blue zones. Remember that blue zones are where people live beyond the average life expectancy, and the only one in the United States is a place called Loma Linda, California, and what's special about that is it's the headquarters for the Seventh-day Adventists, and part of the religious belief uh, for them is eating a vegetarian diet. Uh, they also have a very strong social uh, community, uh, and they believe in regular exercise, and they actually have the best outcomes in terms of uh, overall health. Uh, the other blue zones across the world uh, follow this pattern. Uh, this is another British Medical Journal topic here about uh, nutritional profiles. Whoops. Um, and they basically showed significant outcomes. In fact, in this study here, about half a million adults were followed. Uh, and those with the higher uh, dietary index score, in this case, the FSAM, had, had uh, a significant increase of uh, mortality. So people who had higher scores here ate worse higher mortality from cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, and digestive disease. Now, you may have seen this last year. There were a lot of controversies in Annals of Internal Medicine and others. Uh, there was this group that published what they call this Nutrirect Consortium, and they made dietary guideline recommendations that were actually not guidelines, but somehow they put this in their title. Um, and the panel suggested that uh, adults continue current unprocessed red meat consumption and also processed meat consumption. And meanwhile, both of these say weak recommendation, low certainty evidence. And if you read the article carefully, the article doesn't say this at all. It actually shows harm. And again, every single study that's been published about processor of meat would show harm. So just because someone is eating bacon already doesn't mean you should tell them to continue eating bacon. It's like asking a smoker to continue smoking a few cigarettes a day. Very interesting. And then there was this interesting article that made it through Jack, which is our home journal, of course, um, and they basically said that foods with a complex matrix that are not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease like meats and steaks, uh, and they say that they should not reduce uh, intake of such foods. And again, if you read these articles carefully, the evidence is very weak and non-significant. Uh, so then this came out in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It said that recent publications about red and processed meat suggest we, as a nutrition community, still have a long way to go to ensure the trust of the public and scientific community and the stakes are high. Most of the chronic diseases facing Americans are preventable. We have a responsibility and duty to conduct high quality science. And the recent reports on red and processed meats fell short on many of these points. In fact, there was a really nice editorial that was published in Frontiers in Nutrition about this. They basically said the assembly of papers collected in this group um, uh, highlight here the direct health benefits of a well-practiced vegetarianism uh, and indirect benefits via the effect on the environment. And the British Medical Journal uh, and others um, had a beautiful uh, series of articles in the last year about the effect on the environment. And I would tell you that most of us did not go into medicine because of the environment, but remember that without the earth, we can't live and we can't be healthy. And we found out this summer, especially out here in Colorado and other places, that with all the fires and the world rapidly changing, that the air quality and the environment we live in is more important than ever thought. Um, and then you may have seen this here. This was an interesting article in uh, CERC. Uh, in, their, in their cardiovascular outcomes about the impacts of na uh, national menu calorie labeling. So our national model suggests that full implementation of the U.S. calorie menu labeling law would generate health gains uh, and would make industry reformulate menu items uh, for better benefits, right? So when you tell people what's in foods and how it might in adversely affect them, they're suddenly interested. You know, I wish at, the, at Costco, those $1.50 hot dogs, I think have caused more harm to my patients than probably any other food. And I wish there was a big warning on them. So maybe one day there will be. 
Interestingly, people say, well, fine, if I make this change, how am I going to feel? And it turns out that if you consume a more plant-based meal, you actually are more satisfied and had better blood flow in the regions of the brain associated with food intake, interestingly enough. I also tell people that it's not diet alone. In our pandemic year, stress has been high. Uh, it was interesting in this study, 24 ischemic cardiomyopathy patients uh, were followed and they completed a daily assessment of stress and 14 patients experienced stress-induced increases in their diastolic parameters. So their heart literally got stiffer as they were more stressed. For those of us that deal with erectile dysfunction, which I, I would say I see every day in my clinics, uh, 20,000 men were followed here. They have a 22% decrease in the risk of erectile dysfunction. And those who consume the healthiest diets, in this case, it was a Mediterranean diet, which when practiced in the traditional Mediterranean way is really a plant-based diet. Remember that an American Mediterranean diet is typically uh, very, very high in things like feta and lamb, which is not the traditional Mediterranean diet followed overseas. This is a, an interesting study of a thousand, uh, sorry, a million uh, person years followed up. One serving per day of uh, plant protein from the form of nuts, legumes, and soy dropped car, uh, car, uh, coronary heart disease by 14%. Uh, this was an interesting study here that fried foods are actually dangerous, even plant-based food, foods. So uh, if you ate the most fried food compared to the least, you have 28% greater risk of major cardiovascular events, heart disease, and heart failure. And each risk substantially increased uh, by 3, 2, and 12% respectively with each additional four ounce weekly serving. So you can imagine if you're eating fries every day, what it could do to you. Also realize that when you go to places that uh, like McDonald's as an example, if you eat French fries, they're actually made with many more ingredients. You'd expect French fries to be oil, potatoes, and salt, but uh, they actually add beef and other additives in many fast food restaurants, including McDonald's. So please be careful. So again, another study here uh, showing weight that uh, was recently out um, in this particular study, 16 week randomized clinical trial. Uh, they had 244 participants and they followed a, a low fat vegan diet versus the regular diet. Uh, body weight decreased in the intervention group by six kilograms liver fat and muscle fat, which are markers for diabetes and prediabetes, uh, dropped markedly. It's important that you can't just eat right, you also have to exercise. But in this study, believe it or not, just 11 minutes a day showed benefit. People who sat for eight to 10 hours a day, but got 11 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise were less likely to die. And they used this by following uh, activity trackers, uh, 30, uh, to 40 uh, 30 to 40 minutes per day of this activity attenuates the association between sedentary time and risk of death. I also want to point out that your mind state is incredibly important. So in this particular study uh, here, they uh, reported the frequency of structured exercise and those exercising two times a week and greater than three times a week had a significant uh, uh, lower risk of depression and anxiety up to a quarter. So remember, people really got to get moving to improve their uh, overall health. And sadly, this concept of fit but fat, I think, has had its probably its last nail or two in its coffin. Uh, this study here showed that uh, although physical activity mitigates at least partly the detrimental effects of overweight and obesity, excess body weight per se is associated with a remarkable increase in the prevalence of major risk factors. Uh, and uh, they recommend that in general, weight loss is key in addition to being fit. So this is an interesting article in Wired magazine. For those of you that don't read it, it's sort of a techie magazine. It's very interesting. Uh, they showed how they uh, used technology here to expose a pig farm. Uh, and basically a tip from a whistleblower uh, that a pig farm in Iowa is about to attempt a ventilation shutdown uh, where they uh, have large clusters of livestock killed at once by turning off airflow. Uh, and they used that technology to show it. So I tell you that it's always important to figure out where your food comes from, but it's certainly eye-opening. And it shows up in random places like Wired Magazine. Uh, this was an interesting study that came out that uh, you, if you're diabetic, you might consider getting a hot tub. It turns out that if you have uh, a hot tub, it actually might lower your body mass index and even um, improve your A1C a small amount. Uh, so maybe consider soaking and relaxing a little bit. Another great study, interestingly, uh, of dog owners here. It turns out that if you have diabetes, your dog is more likely. And if your dog has diabetes, you're more likely. So make sure that you get your lifestyle in check for both you and your dog. Uh, this is important about the connection and support I often talk about. One of the tenets of lifestyle medicine is to have a strong social support or love, believe it or not. So in this particular study from Japan, 7,800 spouses of patients admitted to the ICU uh, were compared to about uh, 31,000 random uh, folks. And those with a spouse in the ICU had an increased odds of an event such as chest pain, heart attack, stroke, 
uh, heart rhythm issues, heart failure, et cetera, within 30 days, higher risk of being hospitalized. Uh, people with a spouse in the ICU were more likely to be diagnosed with hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So you can see there's an important connection between uh, uh, people in your life. And if you're worried about Earth's future, the outlook is maybe worse. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, uh, article published. It said here that uh, humans have created an ecological Ponzi scheme and consumption as a percentage of Earth's capacity to regenerate has grown from 73% in 1960 to 170% today. So we are in trouble. Now, there were some better news this last year. Plant-based products infiltrated fast food uh, to meet customer demand. And in fact, this is the fastest growing food segment in the United States. Of course, I wouldn't top it with mayo or cheese like in the picture. Um, and then beyond meat, as I mentioned, many of the plant-based and artificial uh, or, or uh, non-meat meats are actually very, very high in fat, calories, and other additives that I would argue are less healthy than they could be. Uh, so Beyond Meat and others are going to uh, launch some healthier versions of their products. I would point out uh, that uh, I'm not sure if you guys have an intensive cardiac rehab program. There are two approved in the United States, Pritikin and Ornish. Uh, we've done this uh, for about three years now, and the results are amazing. Uh, we put people through the uh, cardiac rehab program and teach them how to live this way, where they do an hour of exercise, an hour of plant-based nutrition with a meal given, an hour of group support, and an hour of stress relief with a certified yoga instructor. And it actually has significant improvements in outcome, uh, both with lower cholesterol, heart blood flow, angina reduction, uh, mindset improvement, and exercise capacity improvement. It's pretty amazing. Uh, here's an example, uh, just so you can see some of the outcomes. This is from 2019, so they always lag a little bit. You can see there's a drop in cholesterol of 21%, triglycerides dropping, blood pressure dropping, uh, A1C dropping, you know, uh, pretty powerful results just from lifestyle approaches. So in short, what is success? It's 100% low-fat, whole grain, minimally processed, whole food, plant-based diet. Albert Einstein said that nothing will benefit human health and increase our chances of survival for life on Earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. Um, we actually have a wonderful program I do called Walk with a Doc. I'd encourage you to check it out where we walk with our patients. Uh, in, in, and we actually did this, this last Saturday, had about uh, 80 people to come and join us. It's one of the most uh, refreshing things that we do. And I would encourage you uh, to consider setting this up in your neck of the woods if it doesn't already exist. Uh, we even offer a Zoom-based, plant-based uh, transitioning support group for people that are trying to make these changes. Uh, it's all done over Zoom with a uh, dietitian who volunteers her time. And if you're not convinced, and I would argue as a physician, it behooves us to spend time reading the literature, the research, and get inspired about this. But when we, you know, use all the latest and greatest medicine stents and technology that are very powerful, um, wouldn't it be nice to then halt disease so you don't see these people back time and time again? And so arm yourself with this knowledge read these books, look at the, the data, watch the documentaries and get inspired. And with that, I left some time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Freeman, for that wonderful review of plant-based diets and its benefits. So while our uh, audience members submit their questions in the chat, I wanna just have you share a personal experience because I know that you transitioned to a plant-based diet and I wonder if you can share with our audience your personal journey to this, this lifestyle. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Isia Dinso and myself uh, trained in Philadelphia, uh, and we trained in North Philadelphia, which I would argue is a relative food desert. So, you know, we would literally uh, eat cheesesteaks, we would have greasy burgers, we would have the greasiest Chinese food, and then we would go tell our patients who just had bypass surgery at age 45 that they shouldn't eat this way. Uh, and, you know, after a while, and we, we didn't get really any nutrition training. I mean, our, our chief at the time, a uh, lovely guy would eat hot dogs for lunch regularly. So, you know, in short, I, I went out uh, after fellowship and, um, you know, here in Colorado, you know, I would argue there's definitely some healthy folks, but we actually have a very growing uh, obesity problem and heart disease problem. But I spent time uh, after my first year in practice throwing pills at people and, you know, people got sort of better. Um, but never lastingly better. So I started, I said, there has to be better and more than this. And I spent time doing my own research, uh, read papers, attended conferences, read books, did documentaries. And then literally, um, you know, one day we were up on a family vacation. I finished my last book 
we'd eaten uh, greasy cheeseburgers up in Steamboat, Colorado. And the next day I was vegan and I have never gone back. It's been about 10 years. Within about three or four months, I lost 30 pounds. I actually redid my life insurance physical. Remember, I had all my Philadelphia cheesesteak weight on me, um, but redid my life insurance physical and got a rebate check in the mail. And I thought that was pretty neat. I'm going to start doing this with my patients. And the results that I've seen with my patients have been extraordinary. Now, of course, not every patient does this. In fact, many patients are resistant that I've had to modify it and pivot and iterate through my technique to not alienate people. Um, but as I've done this over the years, the results of the people who've done this have been literally amazing. I'm talking about diabetes and remission, blood pressure normalizing, weight normalizing, sleep apnea going away. I've even seen a few cases recently of pulmonary hypertension resolving. So I would say that when people change their lifestyle, the health effects are, are phenomenal. Outside of cardiology, I've seen people control their lupus, their rheumatoid arthritis, with no DMARDs on board, no disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, no steroids required. I've seen people with advanced interstitial lung disease require almost no immunosuppression or medicine uh, to keep their disease in check. Now, this is not everybody, and not everybody will have the same results. And I would tell you, I've probably seen no stronger anti-anginal. So you might think nitroglycerin is good or, or renolazine is good, but I would say that following this type of lifestyle has been the most potent, long-lasting anti-anginal I have ever used. So in short, very powerful approach. I'd like to see if there are any questions from any of our faculty. All right, here's a question for you, Dr. Freeman. Um, from Dr. Sperling, how would, how would you counsel an individual eating the regards Southern dietary pattern to move towards a plant-based whole food? How do you recommend incorporating uh, RDs uh, into outpatient cardiology practice? And lastly, uh, what is the data on intensive cardiac rehab in those who have lower socioeconomic status? Yeah, so great question. So um, as Kim Williams, the former president of the American College of Cardiology says, don't let your culture hold you hostage. And as we all know, um, in virtually every religious background and every family gathering, what do we do, right? Family comes in from out of town and we kill some kind of an animal and have a giant roast, right? A pig roast, or we have a big ham or turkey for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, whatever it may be. But why do we do that? And the same thing in the Southern diet, right? When you, if you look at the Southern diet carefully, it's actually loaded with what we would call superfoods, right? Tea. Uh, collard greens, mustard greens, black eyed peas, uh, turnip greens, all these things that most of us take for granted. And the truth is, if you take anything and add lard, fat, ham hocks, whatever it may be, you know, this very paper sitting next to me would be delicious with those things added, but they're not healthful. So what I usually do when I have folks who've moved from the South, and we have quite a few, believe it or not, um, I usually tell them to try to make foods uh, that they're used to making, but with a different approach. And you can actually Google this. There's all these wonderful plant-based Southern diet books uh, and resources available. So people can still make foods that are reminiscent of what they're used to without all the bad stuff. Um, it is pretty scary, sadly, though, um, uh, when people are eating uh, these very diets that are making them so very sick. And so sometimes making them aware uh, that the foods they're eating and the, and the data that's associated with it is very, very powerful. In terms of incorporating RDs into the outpatient cardiology practice, so I would tell you it always takes a village, it takes a team. In my book, nutrition and lifestyle should be mentioned at every single visit, right? It should be one of those things, just like you check blood pressure, you ask them what they ate for dinner last night. You ask them how much physical activity they're getting. It only takes a few seconds, but it gives you a flavor for what they're doing. Um, and I would say that having nurses, nurse practitioners, registered dietitians, um, able to support you in this approach is really powerful and a wonderful resource. When patients say, I need a little more help, what can I do? Really powerful. In terms of an isolated study with outcomes for intensive cardiac re rehab on lower SES, we don't know the answer on that. What we have is just all comers. And I would tell you, at least here in Denver, all of the folks we've had from lower socioeconomic status have the same outcomes as everyone else. Now that said, that's more anecdotal. It's not a huge number of folks but I would tell you that in general, when you teach people how to live, when you hold their hand, they do better. If you look at that small study I showed, when they dropped food off at people's houses, the compliance was 93%. You know, and I'm hoping at one point that, you know, just like we can give out drugs and drugs get covered for patients, I'm hoping that food will get covered. Think about how much cheaper it would be to give people beans, rice, and oatmeal and a, and a bunch of frozen vegetables 
than it would be to give them the latest and greatest, you know, taver stent, whatever it may be. So again, there, there's a lot of great stuff coming down the pike in terms of nutrition and prevention, but I think it's got to get widely covered by insurance and the payers to make it really sustainable. I couldn't agree more. I think we need to get the industry to focus more on prevention than being um, more reactive and be more proactive and talk about the cost savings to insurance plans from that standpoint. Um, here's a question from Dr. Mehta. Patients may feel discouraged if you tell them to stop sugar, meat, eggs, bread, white rice, dairy, things that they enjoy and are eating every day. Um, what is your experience on vegetarianism versus vegan as far as recommendations? Yeah, so it's a great point. So first, I highly recommend that you always ask a patient for permission before you are critical of their diet. This has been a, a simple step I take, but has improved outcomes, meaning people don't complain about me anymore. So what I say to them, you know, would you mind if I'm critical of your diet? And they're like, well, sure, that's why I'm here. Um, almost all the time. Every so often someone says no, and I don't say anything. Uh, but in short, my very strong suggestion is to ask that question and then um, find a motivational interviewing hook for a patient. When you have a 65 year old who just had a grandkid in and they're on a million meds and feel miserable, I ask them if they wanna be around for that great grandkid, but in a way that's meaningful, right? Do you wanna be sitting in the corner drooling to yourself in a wheelchair or do you wanna be dancing at your great grandkid's wedding or whatever it may be? And then I don't tell them that they have to get rid of bread and white rice right away. I, I recommend switching to brown rice and whole grain bread. Um, and I recommend um, when they have a sweet tooth or they want uh, uh, sugar to go with a, a fruit or a vegetable that might be sweet, sweeter or even some dark chocolate. Um, but in short, you know, I usually tell people and most most Americans, most people are often wired in a sort of all or nothing approach. So if you look at when the, the South Beach or the paleo, the keto diets have all come out, why did people do so much better? Well, they got rid of all the garbage in their diet or what I call garbage carbs or garbage. And they did it in an all or nothing approach and they got better quickly in that they were able to drop weight. Now, long-term outcomes and, and, and being able to maintain that diet have not been so good. So in short, what I try to do is tell people that they may uh, need a couple of weeks for their brain to readjust that they're missing something. Remember where I grew up and I always share this story, you know, we had seven inches of pastrami and three inches of cream cheese on every bagel uh, and a piece of pizza weighed five pounds. And you could still enjoy pizza and in fact, when I go out to pizza places, I get it either with no cheese or just veggies and, and sauce, or sometimes they'll have a, a non-dairy cheese and I'll ask them to put a light sprinkling of that on. So these days you can find a non-animal-based version of every food that's actually good. And I'm not just saying that, you know, the first iterations of non-dairy cheeses tasted a lot like chewing plastic. Now they're artisanal cheesemakers making, you know, almond milk-based whatever, uh, it's pretty amazing. So I think these days it's, it's almost impossible to not be able to find something you need when you want it. Um, so in short, it's, it's, it's very powerful if you're up for it. I wanted to talk about um, helping patients successfully transition to a plant-based diet. And this piggybacks off a question that Dr. Lundberg has posed. Some patients sometimes do the all or nothing. And so if they're not successful within that first one to two weeks and, and they've quote unquote fallen off the wagon, they just say, this is not for me. So what do you recommend as far as patients transitioning to a plant-based diet? Would you recommend they try easing it into it, like maybe a meatless Monday and then expanding beyond that? Or what, how do you advise your Yeah, patient? so you don't need to do an all or nothing. That's usually the best for many people, but that's not required. The problem with easing into it is you have to be careful for the once in a while syndrome, I call it. Right. So, you know, I only have hot dogs once in a while. I only have pizza once in a while. I only have pepperoni once in a while. I only have, you know, uh, a, a three egg omelet once in a while. And before long, every day is a once in a while. So I usually tell people to try their best if they want. Maybe they can do it. There's even a book on this, a cookbook on this called Vegan Before Six, where they eat breakfast and dinner. Uh, sorry, breakfast and lunch that are plant based. And dinner is a reasonable plant based meal. I also tell people that if they don't want to switch all the way, you know, where I grew up, you had a giant piece of chicken or fish or whatever, and a few carrots on the side. I tell them to have a giant plate of carrots with a little bite of chicken or fish on the side. But I also try to educate them. I mean, you know, the American curse that this will affect all of us, right? You worked hard your whole life. You save your money. And when you get ready to retire, what do you look forward to? Heart attack, dementia, or, you know, erectile dysfunction, peripheral arterial disease, you know, cerebrovascular disease, these terrible ways to retire, which I don't think any of us want. So what I tell people is this is not a guarantee, but it, is, it puts you in a much better uh, likelihood to have a healthier retirement. 
So I try again to find that motivational hook. I try to get people to do it either all the way, or if they want to do it stepwise, that's fine. But it's important to see them regularly and to provide support, right? If I say to somebody, you should go plant-based, see you later, they never do it. I give them a packet of information. I ask them to watch a few documentaries. I have a walk with a doc program. I have a support group pro, uh, that we offer. I really try to offer everything we can. In addition, if they want uh, an RD session, that's possible. Uh, we're fortunate we have a number of uh, health clubs that are plant-based here in town. I bet you probably do too in, in Atlanta. Um, and so there are lots of options to support people, but it does take a lot of hand-holding up front for people to make these changes. Intensive cardiac rehab, you know, after a heart attack or, or, or a valve or whatever it may be, we can usually get people to do this because we see them twice a week and we hold their hands through it. Um, but for others, it, it does take a lot of coaxing and follow-up. You know, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk was a study that showed that African Americans who received the home delivery plant based meals that more than 90% of them adhere to the diet. And one of the challenges that some of us face um, is access, right, not just expense, but people living in food deserts. Um, so what do you tell those patients who live in food deserts, but are aware of the benefits of a plant based diet and, and are motivated to follow it but can't even get to a place where they can buy these foods. Right. So th these days, um, when it's possible, people can actually get, believe it or not, beans or rice or any of these things shipped to their house. Uh, if you have uh, Amazon in your neighborhood, they'll deliver almost anywhere, um, especially in cities, even in places that may not be considered the best parts of town, so to speak. Uh, so those are options. Uh, sometimes I'll tell people that it's worth, you know, taking a trip to uh, a Costco, a Walmart, a Sam's Club, whatever. Um, that may not be immediately near their house once every week or once a month, even though it's a, it's a hassle to get there and it's two buses or whatever it is. Um, and I tell them to stock up on things that don't go bad right away. So frozen vegetables, you know, large bags of, of brown rice and beans or cans. Um, you know, believe it or not, at the dollar stores that are prevalent in almost any neighborhood, you can find frozen vegetables and canned beans. Um, you know, most people don't think about going to those stores to get those foods, but they're available. So there are ways, but it does take sometimes some creative, innovative approaches to get there. We have a question from Dr. Jokadar. Dr. Jokadar, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Truman. That was a great, great talk. I have a, 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 a relatively easy question and a, maybe a harder question. <laughs> um, the, the, the first question is, uh, you know, the, the data I feel are very compelling a lot of the time, um, but uh, what supplements do you recommend for in particularly athletic uh, athletes, professional athletes who are uh, interested in going uh, plant-based? I think that's the relatively easy, easy, easy uh, part of the question. The, the, second, the second, maybe more difficult question um, is, you know, in my experience, a lot of people, um, you know, that, like I said, the data are compelling, like regarding trimethylamine oxide and some of the sialic acid autoimmunity that, that sometimes occurs. Um, however, uh, some people take veganism almost as a religion where it's, it, it, it ceases to be a productive conversation for some people. Um, you know, they take a moralistic view about, about eating animals, et cetera. Um, and, and so, and so for that reason, uh, a lot of this stuff has, in my view at least, is though coming mainstream, still somewhat, somewhat on the sidelines. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you, could, if you could comment on that. Yeah, so two questions, uh, two uh, answers. So the first, in terms of supplements, believe it or not, eons and eons of human beings did not require supplements, and yet we still are here today. So if you eat well, you really don't need any supplement. You know, you could potentially become B12 deficient, uh, you can actually get that from something called nutritional yeast, which is a surprisingly flavorful product that you can add to things like popcorn uh, to give it a cheesy flavor. But if you decide not to use that stuff, you might need a B12 supplement. Um, there are a number of, of, of multivitamins coming out designed just for plant-based eaters that contain uh, plant-based EPA and DHA along with B12 and others. But in general, if you eat well, you really don't need uh, supplements. Um, and for athletes who are you know, perhaps uh, trying to, you know, build additional muscle. If for some reason they can't get all the protein in through their diet, and believe it or not, it's not as hard as you may think. Uh, I usually recommend a pea-based or some other plant-based protein supplement 
but they really have to be careful that it doesn't have a lot of added sugars and other random things in it, which many of them do, sadly. In terms of um, um, veganism versus plant-based, you know, the truth is I am not one of those people who stands up and, you know, uh, protests against animals and uh, animal whatever. Uh, you know, I would say that that comes naturally as, as you become plant-based, you'll become much more aware of where your food comes from, where your, your clothing comes from, where your products come from. But I would say that in general, um, especially in, in initial meetings with patients and, and even your friends and family, you know, if you come up and, and sort of attack at them, uh, it's a great way to never be invited back. Uh, so in general, uh, I usually don't say, especially in social situations, I usually don't say anything about what I'm doing or eating unless I'm asked or someone pokes fun at me and then I might say something. In general, many times people will see what I'm eating and ask to have some because it looks so good. Um, but in general, I would agree with you that if you um, start going a, a little, what I would call the militant vegan style, uh, it, it, it's almost too aggressive, right? So the bulk of the United States, the bulk of Americans are still eating some form of animal products. Many of us are still using leather-based goods regularly. And if you start going crazy on folks, it's gonna end up causing trouble. Now that said, there are plenty of non-leather leathers now that you can't tell the difference. You know, the last belt I bought from, I think it was like one of those like Gap or Banana Republic was actually vegan leather and he was marked that way. It's not sold that way. I always tell people that the quickest way not to sell something is to slap a vegan sticker on it. Uh, but if you go to Whole Foods and buy their vegan chocolate chip cookies, they're indistinguishable from, from their other ones that taste just as good. But I think, you know, getting people knowledgeable and educating people in a non-confrontational way is critical. Um, and I would be cautious of the people that are the militant vegans. And there are all these movements on Twitter. You may have even seen on cardio Twitter. There are people that attack many of our colleagues because they're not, you know, hardcore. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy about honey as an example, right? Honey, they consider an animal-based food, even though it's not made of animals, it's made of the nectar of plants. And, you know, if you're eating honey and you're a vegan and you post about it, they'll attack you. So in short, I, I don't recommend this approach. I, I, I would say that the militant uh, and non-accepting nature of these folks makes me nervous. Any Thank final you. questions from our faculty? Well, Andrew, I think that you have shared some very convincing literature for sure about the benefits of following a plant-based diet and more importantly, some practical ways that we can take our patients on this journey. I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning and uh, sharing with us this knowledge and uh, hope to catch up with you right after this. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to point out for the audience that this was literally just one year's worth of the highlights of the data. So every single year I try to put together a talk like this and it is eye-opening to see how much is out there. So get knowledgeable. Excellent. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.